I've been asked to speak on pluralism. For me, at its core, this is about social cohesion. If you look at the Oxford Dictionary, it defines pluralism as the existence of many different groups of people in one society. And that is a key part, a key basis in the way our own society is organized. It's a melting pot of people of different races, religions, languages, cultures. Around the world, that concept is being increasingly challenged by the rise of identity politics, populism. If you look at it, why is pluralism critical for Singapore? If we went back to our founding fathers, the operating framework for the survival of our nation was premised on, first, a strong security framework that includes defense, two, a strong economy, and three, social cohesion. So if you go back to 1965, we had 1.9 million people, 580 square kilometers of land. Without security, we would not have survived as a country. Without a viable economy, there would have been no investments, no jobs. We would not have been able to feed our people, and we would have had to go back to Malaysia, which is what Malaysia expected. And three, without social cohesion, the idea of a united society and national identity would have been untenable. Uh, and a lot of people didn't expect us to survive. That was the prognosis in 1965. Uh, no resources, low levels of education, no national identity, no uh, self-defense force. So you contrast that with where we are today, and uh, really I think it's useful to see the contrast. Look at the sum of the outcomes of the governance. Today the GDP is uh, about US 400 billion, citizen population of 3.6 million, land area of 728 square kilometers, I usually show these bubbles because it's the easiest way of bringing the point across. This first set of balloons on the left is the size of the population. On the right is the size of the GDP. So if you look at Singapore, second smallest, and our GDP is bigger than that of Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, Myanmar. It's only behind Indonesia and Thailand. Now, this is quite incredible because there is no reason why we should be bigger than Philippines with its population of 112 million, or Vietnam with 100 million, or Malaysia with 33 million. It's actually quite incredible. Then you look at GDP and land area, another set of balloons. Now you can hardly see Singapore. And, uh, I mean, if you look at Malaysia, 330,000 square kilometers, it's got everything that you can think of, uh, a 30-odd million population, but also every resource you can think of, right, Malaysia. And likewise, Philippines, likewise, Vietnam. Malaysia has timber, it's got oil, it's got palm oil, it's got you know, more people. Why is our economy, I mean, bigger than that of Malaysia or that of uh, Vietnam. I think there's one key, which is a combination of governance, a population that's hardworking and able to access science and technology, and uh, a high-quality education system. So, and if you look at the specific developments, human development. We are, World Bank's Human Capital Index ranks us first out of 157 countries. So if you are a child and you want to be born and you want to find a place where you will have the best potential to uh, the maximize your potential, Singapore is the place to be born in. And if you look at our outcomes in education, PISA scores. There are two parts to this. PISA scores, we are number two. Um, we used to be number one. And this is not, you don't take your best students, you take 
the average students in average schools and then test them. After a while, China decided that the average students all came from Shanghai, Jiangsu, and Sichang in specific schools, and therefore we became number two. If you look at, uh, to me, the more important slide is on the right, the X and Y axis. What you really want is to spend the least and have the best outcomes. And you see that we actually out achieved that. So government is relatively stingy compared with other governments. But then in terms of outcomes, we spend less than Japan, we spend less than Hong Kong, we certainly spend less than Finland. But in terms of outcomes, we do better than all of them. If you look at health, it's even more stark. You look at where we are in terms of spending, and you, we are second only to Japan in terms of outcomes. We have the longest life expectancy, 84.9 years, longest span of living in good health, 73.9, and the eighth healthiest country in the world. All of this is only possible because of a combination of uh, stability, rule of law, educated and skilled workforce, and most importantly, underpinning it all, is a unity that we have been able to achieve within Singapore. So other countries have natural resources, they have big markets, and they don't usually ask existential questions as to whether they're going to exist in 30 years, 40 years, so on. For us, if we are fragmented and disunited, if we lose our core of pluralism and coexistence, if our society is not stable, then that does raise existential questions. In the time available, I will only talk about one type of pluralism, and that's race. But you know, you can apply the same to other issues like religion, politics, and so on. On race, from the beginning, we firmly held to the principle that all races should be treated equally, and that's what got us kicked out of Malaysia. So on the very first day of our independence, 9th of August, 1965, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew famously declared, we are going to have a multiracial nation in Singapore. We will set the example. This is not a Malay nation. This is not a Chinese nation. This is not an Indian nation. Everyone will have his place equal. Now, there were and there are significant racial and religious differences. But over the years, we accepted those differences, and we built a national identity through our laws and policies. Let me explain. From the beginning, we built institutions to protect minority interests. For example, the Constitution imposes a responsibility on the government for the carrying of the interests of racial and religious minorities in Singapore. It also acknowledges the special position of Malays as the indigenous people of Singapore, and the government has to protect their interests. Another example is the Presidential Council for Minority Rights. It was set up in 1970 and is specifically charged with scrutinizing laws passed by parliament to see if they infringe the rights of minorities. The Chief Justice chairs that, and the Law Minister and the Attorney General are members. Second, we put in place policies to promote racial harmony, encourage social interaction across the races. I want to touch only on one policy and by contrasting it with the United States. Because of their history and policies, in the US, you had racial segregation by neighborhoods. This also then limited, uh, in effect, which schools uh, children from African-American communities could send their children to. So let me play a video clip, slightly long, but I think it's worth watching, a BBC clip that deals with this issue. When they went to court, the attorneys, they brought what they called a two-pronged strategy. They wanted to show first that housing segregation helped to create school segregation, that the two things were very much intertwined, and that government policies helped to create that housing segregation. Apparently, there were silent or unspoken sort of practices that had been followed over a period of years that uh, kept some schools all white and some schools all black. 
See, many people were arguing that people decide where they want to live and that, you know, those are all private voluntary choices. And what the attorneys were arguing was that was simply not the case, that the government had made many decisions that helped to create housing segregation. And then that spilled over into school segregation and they fed off each other. It was one of the biggest challenges to racial segregation in education since the Civil Rights Act. Judge Stephen Roth was appointed to handle the case. John Runyon had just joined the court service as his junior clerk. Judge Roth was not regarded as a knee-jerk liberal. He was initially, at the start of the case, rather hostile uh, to the plaintiffs. Judge Roth may have been skeptical, but when the lawyers for Bradley presented their evidence, it was compelling. One of the uh, main pieces of evidence they used was a map. And he put together a 10 by 20 foot map of Detroit. It was color coded and it showed that every piece of real estate in the city was either black or white, right? It, it just showed in very stark terms the level of segregation within the city. Then he had overlays which showed the school district boundary lines which neatly corresponded with the underlying racial divides. So uh, Judge Roth found that there was not only residential segregation but there were actions of both state and local officials which carried this residential segregation over into the schools. Judge Roth's verdict of racial segregation was a huge victory for black families, not just in Detroit, but across the country. Okay. Now, we try and avoid this in Singapore, you know, probably uniquely amongst uh, any country, we intervene in our public housing estate to prevent segregation by races. So by the 1980s, we were seeing clear signs that ethnic enclaves were emerging across Singapore. So if you looked at Ang Mukyo, Haogang, Upper Serangoon, Beach Road, Tanjung Paga, Chinese. Bedok, Tampines, Marine Parade, Yunos, Gelang, Ayaraja, Taban Gardens, Malays. Indians in Yishun and Serangoon Road and Eurasians in Katong. So the ethnic integration policy was introduced in 1989 to ensure that there was a mix of different races, a certain minimum number in each housing estate. So within our estates, and therefore it feeds off into our schools, we ensure a mix of races. If we did not do that, ethnic enclaves would have started to form in Singapore. Even last year, with all our policies, nearly one third of all HDB blocks in Singapore and 10% of our HDB neighborhoods reached their EIP limits. This means the racial concentrations have reached a point where they were going to be higher than our threshold limits. And these threshold limits already have some buffer built in. That's with the EIP in place. So if we didn't have the EIP, the enclaves would have become more pronounced. Of course, the side effect of the EIP is that over time when people want to sell, if you are in a minority and you've reached the limit of the maximum number of Malays or Indians or Chinese, then you can only sell to another person of your own race. But for the minorities, because it's a smaller demand pool, you might take longer to sell, and the, there might be pressure on your price. The Chinese will pay more than, say, someone of your own race. This issue affects only, thankfully, a small number of resale applications. Last year, it affected 1.5% of all resale applications, and they, the people appealed. For this group, HDB exercises flexibility on a case-by-case -case basis, giving them more time to sell, Sometimes, in very exceptional cases, waive the EIP limits, or HDB buys back the units directly for those who have genuine difficulties in selling their flat. Uh, 
So in 2022, one third of the EIP-related appeals were successful. So our approach, rather than do away with the entire policy which keeps Singapore cohesive, we exercise flexibility in a targeted way to deal with the effects directly for the small number who is affected. So this, I, there is a word that the economist uses, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but they say our government is very dirigist. I think it's, we are very interventionist, we direct. But yes, you can be like France. You know, everybody is a Frenchman, and you are free to live wherever you are. But then you look on clubs, and um, you look at the unemployment numbers, you look at the figures where people live, you see very clearly they are segregated by skin color. So I, I think there are some advantages to having an interventionist approach in these things. That EIP was the second issue. The third is we have put in place laws against hate speech, racially incendiary comments, inciting violence against other groups. And these laws apply equally to all. For example, you know, these are recent example, in recent years, these are the people who we took action against by Chinese who wrote down in uh, MRT stations about Malays having to die and various other things. A Malay who pretended to be an Indian or a Chinese woman who said nasty things about Indians. And uh, the polytechnic lecturer who whose uh, sort of rant went viral. Now, our approach, these things, I think, can be said in most countries and wouldn't be noticed, but we take action and people go to jail for them, or they lose their jobs, apart from a criminal conviction. So if you see that, it's in sharp contrast with, and I'll compare two countries. In the US, you can burn the Quran or any holy book in the name of free speech, because their approach is to have a very high tolerance for free speech. For us, we think that if you burn the Quran or the Bible or any of the other holy books, some people will get very upset and we see no reason to allow free speech to get to the extent where you have to put down or denigrate someone else's race or religion. And we will not allow it and the Internal Security Department will come and talk to you. In France, you can put this sort of cartoons against the Holy Trinity, the Pope, and the Prophet, right? Having Father, Son, and Holy Spirit having anal sex, cartoon of the Pope holding a condom like a sacrament and saying, this is my body. And the third one, cartoon of the Pope saying, this, that dung and many oh, I had my doubts under the headline, God doesn't exist. And uh, if you see the next set of cartoons, this is about... Uh, Jews and Muslims and the Prophet. Again, we will not allow these remarks, comments, attacks, and we are actually further updating our laws. And I recall, I think uh, I see Prof. Tomiko here and uh, Bilahari, they got into an exchange with the French ambassador who said, oh, well, you know, there's a reason for the French approach of allowing all of this. And uh, I think the basic point that Prof. Ko and uh, Bilahari made is, well, you know, yes, you can allow people to say what they want, but what if it inflames passions? You cannot be absolutist about these things. And uh, you need to draw a line. And you know, society as a whole has got to come together and should agree to draw these, some of these lines. And uh, I think the French ambassador's, then French ambassador's response was, oh, but you know, we don't allow anti-Semitic remarks, and there you are. So you have decided what you will not allow. And if you won't allow anti-Semitic remarks, then why do you allow remarks against a prophet? Or for that matter, against a pope? Uh, or the Catholics? And it's not a well-known fact, but in quite a few countries in Western Europe, if you denied, if you denied the existence of the Holocaust, that's a criminal offense. So they are informed by their history. So when it comes to denying the Holocaust, free speech doesn't apply. But when it comes to running down the prophet or the pope, then free speech applies. So we need to look at these things and decide how uh, you know, the world acts, and we need to work for ourselves.
February this year, the Ministry of Manpower enhanced the tripartite guidelines on fair employment practices to guide employers and employees on how to be sensitive at the workplace. For example, discrimination along racial lines is prohibited. My ministry, Home Affairs, will also be introducing the Maintenance of Religious Harmony Act later this year to better protect racial harmony and to signal the importance of racial harmony in Singapore. Uh, now, if you look at current challenges, we are still a work in progress. No society can claim that it is free from racism, and I think if we claimed that, we won't be telling the truth. Uh, but the reality is we don't pay for all our differences. We don't adopt uh, what some places call a race-blind approach. We don't think we should ignore race. That will not solve our problems. So we take a race-sensitive approach. So government manages race-related issues to ensure that racial minorities are not disadvantaged. That's why English is our working language, language in schools, language of business. When we gained independence, some senior Chinese business persons went to see Mr. Lee and told him, asked him, now that we are independent, make Mandarin the main language. And he said, no. He told them, if we did this, our races would get into conflict, the minorities will feel disadvantaged, and Singapore would fall apart. So we deliberately recognized English, Chinese, Malay, and Tamil as official languages, and made English our working language, common to all races. And our starting point has to be to accept that racism is innate in human beings, and therefore racism is present in Singapore, like in any society, but we need to work hard to make sure that it's not institutionalized. And if you ask, are there advantages to being in the majority in Singapore? It's obvious and undeniable. Anyone who denies that is not being objective. So if you're Chinese in Singapore, you have an advantage because you're part of a majority race. And we cannot deny that there is casual racism, some prejudice in Singapore, like in any society. But the key is that we, I think, deal with it better than most places. And we, as I said, have tried to make sure it is not part of the institutions, it's not institutionalized, and in fact, our laws and our structures and systems and institutions, like the PCMR that I spoke about, Presidential Commission for Minority Rights, and the committee that looks at all legislation, these are all institutions we have set up, and we work hard to deal with this. So in the interest of time, I've only spoken about race today. But as I said, these principles of being aware of differences, acknowledging them head on, and then dealing proactively with them, rather than to paper over them, has to be applied to other issues too. Pluralism, multiculturalism, is a foundational block for Singapore's success. It's painstakingly, painstakingly forged by our founding fathers and the generation since, but it can easily change, as you see in many parts of the world, if you don't manage it carefully and constantly tend to it and make sure your legal framework is there. But the legal framework can only do so much. It can say what people cannot do. It can't make you like each other. That has got to be through societal effort and a government has a big role to play in all our housing estates and a lot is done to bring our races together, to have activities, to have increased mutual understanding, and uh, build our grassroots organizations and civil society organizations to have genuine empathy and understanding for the different races and to accept each other. That's a very key part. That's when people develop the strong bonds across their differences. Once you have that, then the small minority who transgress, you can take action with your tough laws. But if laws, if you go and think of laws as your solution for these fundamental social issues, and if a lot of people are used to transgressing them, you wouldn't be able to apply your laws. The laws work in Singapore. We are able to charge those people that I gave you examples of because they are in the extreme tiny minority. If that's a majority behavior,
we wouldn't be able to enforce. So that is my you know, uh, few comments on this. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Minister. That was a powerful speech on pluralism. And you chose to focus on race primarily. I think your graphic illustrations of some fairly very inflammatory <laughs> uh, statements on race and religion hit us in the stomach, didn't it? It hit me, and I think it came as a bit of a shock. Now, our topic today is revisiting pluralism. The French love it, <laughs> <laughs> even though that particular magazine has been closed down. Well, and those who don't defend the right to, the, to free speech. So I think it's really a major difference in how different societies look at the problem. Yeah. <clears throat> the, now, uh, as you've said, Minister, pluralism is a very broad term. The word plural society, from which pluralism comes from, was coined by a Dutch historian, J.S. Furnival, when he observed Malaysia and Singapore, Malaya and Singapore, when he was writing. And he saw that colonialists brought different races, immigrants, races, ethnic communities into the society to help build the colonial society. And he said, these communities, these races, they met in the marketplace, but they did not combine. The key phrase he used was, they mixed, they met, they mixed, but did not combine. Now, with nationhood, our governments have tried to make the different races combine. And you've just heard efforts that were used to make the different communities combine in harmony and peace. Now, we see plural, plural society morph into the word pluralism, and we use the word diversity, we use identity politics as well. So you hear these words used quite interchangeably. We have now two speakers who will either respond to minister <laughs> or <clears throat> have their own take, give us their own take on the topic. The first respondent is Zuraida Ibrahim, who is the executive um, managing editor of South China Morning Post. Most of you would know Zuraida as the foreign editor of Straits Times before she moved to SEMP. I must also add that she is a graduate of the Political Science Department of NUS. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the second respondent is Corina Lim. Corina Lim is the executive director of AWARE. She is a lawyer by training, and she was the eighth uh, SR Nathan Fellow and delivered her a series of lectures on gender equality. So these are our two respondents. They each have about 10 minutes, after which we will throw the um, session, uh, we'll give over the session to the audience and you can ask your questions. Zuraida? Um, thank you, Professor Chan. As some of you know, Professor Chan was my teacher. Um, time has been a lot kinder to her than some of us. Uh, thank you, Minister Shamugam, for that very insightful speech. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. The topic of pluralism is an extremely important one, and I would like to thank IPS for including me in this conversation. Rather than respond directly to uh, the Minister's speech, if I may, I'd like to take a step back and broaden our discussion a little. I think it's useful to consider two different dimensions of pluralism. The first is cultural pluralism, which form a major part of uh, the minister's remarks. What are the different ethnicities, languages, religions, and other identities that make up our multicultural society? How do we ensure that all these groups feel a sense of belonging and live in mutual respect? 
But there is another dimension to consider, political pluralism. The relevant questions are, to my mind, to what extent do our decisions as a society factor in competing ideas and interests? What is the range of voices permitted in the public square? Is the diversity of opinion in our society reflected in our parliament? I think most people would agree that Singapore can be described as a culturally plural society, but would hardly count as politically plural. So the debate is really about whether this state of affairs is good or bad. Singaporeans naturally have divergent opinions on these questions. Let me first say something about cultural pluralism. It is clear on the ground, Singapore is a highly plural society in cultural terms. As the minister pointed out, due to the immense range of protections, no religious group claims a majority. We have four official languages protected by the law. Racial minorities receive official recognition. Generations of intermarriages mean that Singaporeans are even more colourful than the, the official C, CMIO palette. Um, the government's commitment to cultural pluralism is, of course, very clear from the minister's very strong statements about the necessity of social cohesion to nation building. The GRC system, the PAP's internal policy on multiracial cabinets, support for Malay and Tamil language media, all these things give ethnic minorities some confidence that they won't be swarmed by majoritarian forces like um, Malaysia under AMNO or India under the BJP. But to my mind, the question is whether that is enough. Is cultural pluralism merely ab about avoiding worst-case scenarios like race riots? Or should it be a much more positive vision? Here again, I think there are divergent views. There are many cosmopolitan Singaporeans who see cultural diversity as a very good thing, but others see cultural diversity as a fault line to be feared and tightly managed. These debates result in many real-world controversies. One that was resolved after decades of debate when the government finally allowed Muslim nurses in public hospitals to cover their hair. This was an issue that I followed closely. This was more than just a symbolic issue, as the old rule had kept many Muslim girls and women out of a noble profession they would have liked to join. Although the government eventually did the right thing, many Muslims, as well as some non-Muslims with multicultural ideals, were troubled by the delay, the long delay. To them, it looked as if Singaporeans with prejudices against Muslims had too big a say in influencing the pace of change. As for Muslim men, we are yet to see full equality in national service assignments. The Singapore Armed Forces enjoys immense prestige. So what does it do to young, Malays, young Malay men's sense of self-worth and perceptions of them when they continue to be underrepresented in green? And I will put it to you, overrepresented in grey. I don't mean to suggest that the position of Muslims in Singapore is the only or even the most important topic that we're talking about uh, when we discuss cultural pluralism. I'm just citing it as one of the many complex issues that we have to think through. Um, some Singaporeans blame Muslims for wanting to be different. But of course, pluralism doesn't mean erasing differences. It means accommodating differences. I don't think most minorities see their beliefs or cultures as making them less Singaporean. So it is sad when that's how they are made to feel. I think many more minorities would say that one of the biggest barriers to belonging today is not how they dress or look or what they eat, but the use of Mandarin instead of English in multiracial social settings and I dare say, even at some workplaces. I don't recall IPS asking about this in its many surveys about race relations, so I hope it will do so in future. I think the government has been extremely good at setting guardrails, as Minister Shan pointed out. We know it will crack down on racism, hate crimes, and religious extremism, for example. And I think this is reassuring to most Singaporeans, especially minorities. But within these guardrails, there are still subtler forms of discrimination, and the question is how much of it is acceptable. So I think the difference is not over principles, but about the pace and the level of acceptance.
Let me now say something very quickly about political pluralism. In a way, this is more straightforward than cultural pluralism because how much Political pluralism, Singapore wants will be settled partly through elections. Consistently, around 4 in 10 Singaporeans tell us through the ballot box that they are not comfortable with the extent of PAP domination and want a more plural system. But the PAP is cautious of political pluralism. And of course, the ruling party can take comfort in the other side of the electoral coin, which shows that overall, 6 in 10 Singaporeans are okay with the status quo. But I believe we shouldn't underestimate public desire for a more plural political system. When offered higher quality opposition candidates, a high proportion of swing voters tend to use their ballots to register their desire for a more plural parliament. This wish is expressed even more clearly in presidential elections. In the last competitive election in 2011, the government endorsed candidate could not secure a majority of the votes. Dr. Tony Tan won with around 35% of the vote in a four-way fight. Until last week's political watchers were wondering whether this appetite for a more plural system could affect this year's presidential election. But then, Typhoon Taman struck. I agree with observers who say that Mr. Tharman Shamugaratnam's entry into this year's race as the putative government-backed candidate shows how badly Cabinet wants to avoid the awkwardness of another close-fought close election. He's not just a big gun. The former nominated MP Zulkifli Baharudin called him the nuclear option. So I think the PAP knows what most Singaporeans want, a more plural system with more competition and more checks and balances, but with a capable PAP government remaining in power. And the Workers' Party also knows this, which is why its leaders are extremely anxious to dispel any fears that it can or even wants to take over government in the short term. Most ruling parties in most countries would be over the moon if both the main opposition and the electorate had no wish to oust them from power. But Singapore is not most countries, and the PAP is clearly unhappy that the people want to have their cake and eat it too. The security of PAP government, but in a much more competitive system. Since independence, the PAP has had no experience in governing with anything other than a supermajority, as well as near total domination of all social and political institutions. So it's not surprising that the prospect of greater political pluralism is not attractive. There's a final aspect of cultural and political pluralism that I think is worth mentioning. This has to do with class. I think that most Singaporeans would like to believe that even if there's a great range in wealth and income, rich and poor can interact very comfortably in common public spaces like hawker centres, public schools, public parks, and in national service. However, I sense that there is a niggling concern about the more open and common displays of extreme wealth. This, this seems to be creating a separate world that is completely alien to 99% of Singaporeans. Um, forgive me for importing a term from Hong Kong, but I think there are sing some Singaporeans who fear that we are at risk of becoming one country, two systems, if we are not careful with this trend. I think the government, whether it acknowledges this publicly or not, will need to work hard to persuade citizens that it is still single-mindedly focused on the interests of the other 99%. Whether it succeeds will be answered in the next general election. Thank you. Thank you, Zoraida. Corina. Thank you. Good afternoon, Minister Shamgum, Prof Chan Heng Chi, everybody. Grateful for this chance to speak on a topic that is close to my heart. Um, Min Chan has talked about race pluralism, and Zoraida has covered culture and politics, and I would like to cover social pluralism. I'm the executive director of AWARE, but on this occasion, I'm speaking on a more personal basis. And on this occasion, my views may not represent AWARE's views. I speak from the vantage point of someone who is both privileged and marginalized, and as someone who has worked in the social justice space for more than 30 years. My privileged position, that's clear from my profile. My marginalization, less so. It is my experience as a gay person in Singapore 
covering up my sexuality from my family, colleagues, and until now, in the public sphere. When I was younger, there was firstly no acceptable words to speak about this. The term LGBT came into being in the world only in the late 80s and made it into the Singapore lexicon in 2000s. Being a stigmatized minority is difficult, and even more so when this marginalization is hidden and invisible. Being in a closet was no fun at all. It is, in fact, quite painful and lonely. And as a young lawyer, my main aim was to migrate to a more gay-friendly country with lots of nature. That was 30 years ago. Thankfully, I found a women's cause, or perhaps it found me, and I'm still here in Singapore. My work as a gender equality activist has been an important part of my identity. If I could not speak up for myself safely, I could do so for the women who had it a lot worse than me. The women who were victims of family violence, sexual assault, workplace discrimination, harassment. And this is probably, probably the first time that I'm sharing about my own personal situation in a public setting. Why now? Section, the repeal of Section 377A probably has something to do with it. It feels a bit safer these days to talk about these things. Secondly, if we are to take pluralism forward in Singapore, it is important to create brave spaces for the marginalized to share their experiences. It is only when we can speak about this and can hear the human stories of marginalization and alienation that we can begin to start talking more deeply and sensitively about these controversial topics without causing antagonism and polarization. And so I chose to speak about this today, even though it is still a bit scary, because I want to ground this discussion in the lived experiences of the marginalized person and to emphasize why it is so important for Singapore to get this right. We want, we want everyone in Singapore to feel like this is their home where they can be fully appreciated and accepted for who they are. A place where they can show up fully at work and in the community, and where they do not have to hide or be ashamed of any aspect of themselves. I know of too many LGBT persons and families with children with disability who have left Singapore as they f did not feel that they could thrive here. I came close to being a part of that, that statistic, but I'm glad that I stayed. The recent repeal of Section 377A shows just how Singapore is constantly evolving. Change always feels too slow for an activist, and by, sat by definition, we cannot be satisfied with the status quo. But in the 30 years of being an activist, I've seen changes in almost all areas of work that are where and I have been involved in housing for single parents, protection against workplace harassment, the recent changes being made to the Women's Charter to give stronger protection to non-physical family violence, the white paper on women's development affirming gender equality as a top priority of Singapore, the forthcoming Workplace Fairness Act. All these changes are of critical importance to the lives of single mothers, LGBT persons, and people experiencing abuse, violence, workplace harassment, and discrimination. But these changes did not come about so easily. There are always opposing considerations, opposing groups. And the way that we make change is as important as the change itself. So it has to be made in Singapore. It has been made gradually, but sometimes too gradually. Um, it took a long time to get to the repeal of 377A, but when the decision was made, it was done in a very sensitive way, consulting both sides. And I think the government played a really amazing role as a national mediator. I know from my friends in the LGBT movement about all the many consultations that they had with decision makers. So it's important to promote pluralism as a counterforce to polarization. Pluralism, to me, is fundamentally about embracing diversity 
and promoting equal participation in society. It's about the acceptance of different views and perspectives. And um, as an NGO, uh, AWARE has strived to, to, to not polarize, even as it tries to push for change. So it's important to have the data, research and advocacy uh, in a reasonable way is very important. We should always assume good faith. We engage, and I've engaged many times with Minister Shamogam, uh, so it's important to speak to policymakers to understand their point of view and for them to also hear your point of view, back door and front door through the media. It's important to understand that we are playing the long game and to keep at it. And dialogue and understanding to be reasonable and always persistent is important. I can see that this is not possible for all causes. For the gender cause, it was, it's a softer cause in Singapore. It is, we have more access to policy makers. And um, this may not always be possible for other groups. And I've seen Singapore also since probably after 2011, the GE election then, become a lot, Singapore government become a lot more approachable to groups. And I think this is really important as part of the whole sort of pluralistic um, culture that we want. It is critical that the, the role that the government plays is that of both mediator as well as to protect the minorities because in a plural system, if everyone's voice is counted and embraced, the majority should not be allowed to bully the minority. So it is important that there are some fundamental safety and rights that everyone has. So to that extent, um, the Workplace Fairness Act is, for me, the most important upcoming initiative by government my disappointment in this is that it does not appear that it will actually include LGBT persons. And um, this is disappointing because the law on 377A was changed and we really, you know, to, be, to leave out that group almost seems ironic. It's like the Discrimination Act discriminating against LGBT persons. I hope that some consideration will be given to that. As we go ahead, change will become more complex, not less. Um, yesterday, I got a text from someone who says, can, can, you, can anyone do anything about this? An institution is re refusing to hire a trans woman so in tra who's in transition unless she takes surgery first, but that's pressurizing her to take surgery. She's not fully considered. They are concerned that, patient, that, that people will get confused. Um, this person was willing to be male presenting, was willing to use the handicap, uh, the, the, the toilets for dis persons with disability, and she also said if they wanted to, she would cut her hair, um, and she's struggling for a job. So all of these issues, it will become more and more complex as we begin to understand gender and sexuality more. Uh, if we are going to have a plural society, what about children who have neurodiverse abilities, um, what do we do to make sure that every single person in Singapore has a place, has basic rights, and accommodation to uh, public goods and services? Thank you. I think I'll end here. Now, you have heard three very strong speeches two from the respondents and one from minister. Uh, I have a question, but I see the question that I was going to ask is reflected in one of the questions that uh, the audience has asked, a member of the audience has asked. And I'd like to lead off with this and follow up with questions from the floor. And the question is, what does the future of Singapore's pluralism look like? Um, the uh, Singapore, when will, will Singapore ever be able to move away from the CMIO structure of pluralism? Mm. 
Minister, would you care to kick off and then, <coughs> you know, I'll see if there is a quick response from the other two. Okay. Uh, I think uh, we should not overemphasize the importance of CMIO classification. Because if you look at it, in most aspects of our life, we don't think along CMIO lines. I mean, just take a simple example. When we come here, do we think of CMIO? It's useful in specific contexts. I talked about ethnic integration policy. It applies in limited contexts where the state, for example, you want to help minorities, self-help groups, Mandaki, Sinda, Eurasian Association, CMIO helps. But uh, you think back to ordinary lives in Singapore, in which other context is CMIO relevant? Today, it's your education, where do you want to go to school, what kind of opportunities you get, you know, what kind of jobs you can get, economy. It's, a, it's an open society with a lot of open opportunities, which is not somehow tied or restricted to CMIO classification. And I don't think we should be you know, too caught up with that. CMIO is relevant for some areas. Do we do away with it? You heard me speak about EIP, why we need in some contexts, but I don't think it defines us in many other ways. That's my view. Uh, quickly, because I have a yeah. view too. Okay, <laughs> I find myself agreeing with the minister. I think the CIMO or CIMO model is a gross, gross oversimplification of what goes on on the ground, the diversity that's on the ground. And I think, speaking as a minority, I do want racial identity to still be tracked, if only because we want to be able to measure outcomes. So I would rather welcome more data rather than less data. I think the challenge and the policy conundrum that we face when it comes to the CMIO model is how to... And, and Singaporeans are proud of their racial identities. How do we ensure that we maintain that without also allowing or enabling racial chauvinism? I think that's the challenge and the fine line we have yeah. to track. I have two points on this. One is what happens now when we have um, interracial marriages. And mom and dad are different races. Firstly, I'm not sure. I suspect the authorities will choose dad's race. No, they, the families choose. The families choose, Family. okay. But, you know, I mean, that's sort of not res reflective of what their actual race oh, is. There are about 200 it, other races <laughs> that are included in the registration now. Okay, great. So there's some, some accommodation for and that. And hyphenated yeah. identities too. Yeah. Okay. The second point is whether or not it hampers Singapore's growth. So I am not 100% sure about this, but I understand that the immigration policy in Singapore is to try to maintain CMIO and the percentage that there is in Singapore, which yeah. means that we will try to keep the Chinese percentage and the Malay and Indian uh, at to, to as, as much as possible to what it originally was. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether that then hampers Singapore's development. What I loved about my time in New York was that there seemed to be a lot of acceptance, like it's a very, very plural society, and there were so many different races, and it was such an interesting place because of that diversity. And I wonder whether we can move towards that, right? Can we have a vision for even more racially, ethnically, culturally diverse country? Yeah. Hey, Chi, can you. I just yes. uh, deal with that point on uh, immigration and uh, percentages? Government is publicly committed to keeping our racial uh, percentages more or less uh, constant. Why? A lot of people think it is actually to keep the Chinese percentage at 70-odd. No, that's not the reason. It, it, this is where the rubber hits the road, and policy has got to deal with practicalities. The main community that is concerned about immigration are not the Chinese or the Indians. Yes, sir, Every dialogue that I have with senior Malay community leaders the main question they have for me, would you make sure that the Malay community is at 14 to 15%? Because for us to get immigrants of Chinese ethnicity is not an issue. For us to get immigrants of Indian ethnicity is not an issue. 
But try persuading highly skillful, successful Malays from Malaysia or Indonesia to come to Singapore. That is the challenge. And the Malays are very, very uh, uh, sort of mindful that they want to be the second largest community in Singapore. Now, you mess with that, you undermine Malay confidence. So our guarantee that these percentages would, we will do our best to keep them constant is actually because of the Malay community. Yeah, thank, thank you, Minister. I just wanted to add that, you know, I'm someone who accepts all races and would like to, you know, treat everybody in the same way. But I have noticed that if you don't emphasize the Chinese, Malay, Indian, paradigm, others' paradigm, in a majoritarian society like ours, people forget. I've been to situations where I say to the organizer, where are the minorities? These are, you know, university students gathered in America. You have to make an effort to make sure minority views are represented. And that's because we are so aware of the different ethnicities in our country. Thank you. Uh, I think there are questions if I may move. Yes, I think it's Stephanie. Hello, Prof. Um, I'm Stephanie Yuan Thio. I'm chairman of SHE. Um, thank you very much for the sharing, and especially Karina, thank you very much for that personal sharing. I was very touched. Karina and I are good friends. Um, we've talked about pluralism in terms of race and pluralism on a number of various other metrics. I think the pluralism of tomorrow is going to be about ideas and it's going to be about values. And so race and all these constructs may, may be relevant but may not be the only things. The thing that worries me is Singapore has got a very, um, it's, we've got very porous borders. We've, we're one of the most highly digital nations in the world. Our young people are very much impacted by what's happening out there. How do we maintain, how do we ensure that the pluralism that we adopt for ourselves, um, that construct, those are the values of our people, by which I, I don't just mean citizens, but our residents, our community. How do we make sure we do that in a situation where the internet is um, taking over the world and our young people are learning their values from that part of the world? The second part of my question can be a little bit sensitive. I appreciate everything Karina said, and, and I can understand the struggles. Um, but our young people these days are also being asked to adopt a set of values that may not be necessarily their own. And if somebody doesn't adopt the woke speak, whatever that might be, whether it's LGBTQ or something else, uh, then you know, are they at risk of cancel culture? Are they at risk of being personally attacked? How do we maintain those guardrails that we've talked about in the age of the internet? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, two questions. Minister, would you like to respond first? Can I say no? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think the real issue here is, look, uh, you can sit and theorize about it, and I'm a practical person. It's happening. It's going to happen, right? That's why ICA under me now has got 200, uh, as I said, races that you can go and put in. And I asked my people, what happens if an Indian and a Chinese come together and say, my son is an Eskimo and the parents choose and we are supposed to <laughs> put that down? So, you know, we run into these kinds of questions. But basically, uh, you just got to accept this is the way the world is going. We are a small place. I think there is a lot of strength that can come from diversity. That's why we never thought in terms of all the four, you know, five, whatever number of races that you can find, put them together and everything becomes one. There's, each of us has, comes from a great tradition, great culture, there is strength in it. And you overlay a Singaporean national identity on top of that and you try and grow. And in a way, we find that that's actually stronger. There's a lot of strength that you draw from each other as long as you can keep the harmony and the peace. And likewise, in many ways, having many different faces, different races in Singapore, uh, 
And if we can integrate them into our society and give them a Singaporean identity, I think uh, I see that as a strength. Now, internet is a huge challenge. You see that happening in other countries. I'm not going to deny it. I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> All I can say to you is we have to try and do our best. Yeah. Right. Any other answers? Yeah, but I'd like to say that I try... I mean, I'm not much on social media for a reason because I value my mental health and it's tough out there. There are tons of trolls. Uh, and I think it is... But it is a, it is a fact of life. It, you know, the internet is there. It has its, its great users. But I think what we really need, uh, and that's why I chose to share my story as well, we need to be able to talk about these things. And in a way where we are not increasing the antagonism, but instead increasing the understanding. And that you can do, for example, by way of stories, uh, for the very sensitive topics that AWARE deals with, like what is the experience yes, of Indian you. women? It's a bit more thank sensitive. We you. write, we have books, and it's stories that we tell, right? So I think that is one way. It's important to be able to, uh, I think, develop the skill of empathy. If we can develop that in schools, and if we can develop ways of actually arguing on the internet, in our schools, that would be good. Uh, people sometimes act up because they feel alone. And that's why I think it's really important to have safe groups that you can have. And one hope that I have in, t in terms of a plural society is, can we liberalize uh, the registration of, say, LGBT groups? Those groups that are dealing with more sensitive topics instead of just support groups. But they, aware it's a gender equality group, we were registered in 1985, but I understand for a long time LGBT groups have not been able to, ever, to um, be registered as a research or advocacy or community sort of empowerment group. It, it has to be much more about support. So I feel like if we can do some of these things and create safe spaces for people, but also teach them, train and, and empower people to be able to deal with differences, uh, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, there's a question at over there, is it? Yeah. Right. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Minister. Um, I'm Eddie, a student from National University of Singapore. Uh, the, my question is a bit of a digression, but also a segue from the previous question. Uh, so, it, as mentioned in the panel discussion, in the pursuit of pluralism, we face increased diversity of thought. Uh, we have increased diversity of opinions on considerations. So, particularly on morality, in defining when, how, and what actions are moral or immoral. Uh, and as the world grows increasingly divided, as potentially the Singaporean people, is the government prepared to dictate, define, and even enforce morality in the public sphere? Uh, m more importantly, is the government willing to do this on morally principled grounds rather than pragmatic considerations and moderated expediency to achieve this? Um, I add the caveat here that this question is particular towards issues such as abortion and euthanasia. Uh, the latter of which is currently a hotly debated topic in scholarly legal discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Minister, moral <laughs> pluralism. <laughs> okay. Values. Yeah. Um, initially, when I was listening to the question about is the government uh, prepared to get into legislating on morality, <laughs> said, you know, there are certain things government should keep out of. Uh, government should deal with criminal conduct, to deal with uh, stuff that clearly damages society and for the rest in a free society it's for people to decide how they want to lead their lives. But uh, specific issues like abortion and uh, similar issues which you see are a serious uh, subject of serious debate. My personal views and I think these views reflect uh, that of many in cabinet and it's reflected in our laws. I think if you lead leave it to society to debate and uh, leave it to the courts 
then it's a zero-sum game where, you know, one side wins, one side loses, and then the fight never goes away. You have row, we wait, but the debate doesn't get settled and the other side mobilizes and many years later it comes back into court. I think here the government has a duty not to, sh not to shy away, not because it's politically very difficult. Government has a duty to go there, mediate between different sections in society, and then put a framework of laws, just like we did with 377A. I mean, it's the easiest not to touch it, just leave it, and then say, well, you know, the courts did it and it's got nothing to do with us. But would that have been responsible? So likewise, an abortion, if you believe that a woman gets to decide what she wants to do with her body, and if you believe that that's the right thing to do, then the government has a duty to go out there and persuade the population that that's the right thing to do. Get parliament, parliament should be dealing with this. And if a majority of Singaporeans think that that's not, a woman cannot decide on what to do with her body, then so be it, you know. But thankfully here, this was settled long ago, and similar issues which touch on fundamental issues for society or social issue. We have been able to talk to our population, get a buy-in, and move at a pace which our population is comfortable with, but always saying that we will be responsible. We won't duck the issue. We won't pass it on to the courts, because I don't think the courts are the best place to deal with these things. Thank you. You know, there are more questions, so I won't go through the panel. Look, over there. Hi. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Darren Muck from uh, Plan B, and I have uh, one, one main question about uh, national identity and nation building, but split into two broad uh, subtopics, I suppose. The first Short one... questions, please. Eh? Short <laughs> questions. Okay, the, f the first is about language. Minister shared just now how um, early in Singapore's development, there were proposals to make Chinese the national language of Singapore. And of course, we pushed this down because nation building requires a neutral and common uh, working language, which we have settled on as English. But recently, we've seen some cases where new foreigners, new citizens, for example, are either unwilling or unable to speak English. And this has caused some uh, unhappiness uh, among minority communities in particular. So I, I, I want to get the minister's uh, view on whether or not you think that we might be heading back to that situation. The second question is related to this. It's about um, how, by chance, two of the largest uh, populations in the world, China and India, they happen to be two of our major ethnic and racial groups here as well. So when Minister shared about how government is committed to keeping population percentages intact in Singapore, coupled with our naturally degrading uh, population demographic growth. This means that immigration is a necessity for Singapore. So I wonder if these two facts coupled together mean that we are opening ourselves up in the name of pluralism, in the name of maintaining this plurality, to being seen almost as conduits for foreign influence, I suppose, uh, because we know that language, things around the world are showing us that language really matters because it influences the kind of information that your people have access to. So uh, I just want to get Minister's view on this, whether or not, for example, Chinese migrants who refuse to learn English, who are unable to learn English, and who maintain a very strong rootedness in the Chinese sphere of information on the internet, whether these are potentially uh, roadblocks for creating a cohesive Singaporean identity. Yeah. Uh, it's not the Chinese who decide whether they become permanent residents or citizens. It is the Singapore government that decides whether they become permanent residents or uh, citizens. And there are a set of very clear, careful criteria. And we have to decide and we have to be satisfied that they are clear plus. And by and large, the majority of uh, the persons who become permanent residents, and you know, you can't just become a citizen overnight. You've got to be first a PR, and you've got to demonstrate that economically and socially you're going to be able to contribute to Singapore. And then you wait a number of years before you can qualify for citizenship. And by the time you qualify for citizenship, we assess you very carefully. So 
Are you a net plus for the society? You are only allowed in if you are a net plus, and by and large, most of them are able to converse in the languages that are available here. And I think you can be sure, given our education system, that's a passing phenomena because whether the parents can or cannot speak uh, English, the children speak English very quickly. So the key is that uh, we, as you mentioned in your, uh, in the in the course of your remarks, we have no choice but to have immigration because, you know, we are a. Our TFR is less than two. The Chinese TFR is about one. We are halving in every generation. The Indian TFR is at uh, 1.2, 1.1. Even the Malay TFR is now below two. We are not reproducing ourselves. So you, you know, you've got bigger challenges than some people not being able to speak some languages. You've got a major challenge facing Singapore, which is the demographic time bomb, which is not being talked about. But we try and make sure that you know the people we assess are able to integrate into Singapore. That's the key thing. Are they able to integrate? Uh, you, I think there was one other point you mentioned about I India and China and uh, whether they're going to come in. Um, I made the point earlier. Actually, we we calibrate and we have a quota because you know the Malay TFR is higher than the Chinese and Indian TFR, so there are more Malay babies. And so we take that into account in deciding what the level of immigration into Singapore is by Indians and Chinese, broadly to keep to the percentages that already exist. Uh, time is running out. I'm going to ask for five or ten more minutes, okay? And uh, there's a question there. Wow, there's a question there, and I have a question too. <laughs> <laughs> Professor, may I? Uh, it's over there, yes. yes. Right, I'm right here. Hi, I panelists. I'm Zahid Zailani. I'm from the National University of Singapore. And on the question of uh, pluralism, so I might refer the panelists to Pioneer Magazine, which is from the Singapore Armed Forces, on the uh, 10th of December 2022, whereby it states that uh, the the Republic of Singapore Navy just received its first female Malay officer, a uh, commission officer. While we understand that Ms. Gan Xiao Huang, who previously was a Brigadier General in the, um, in the Air Force, is there a problem with pluralism, sorry, pluralism within the Malay community, or is there a pluralism issue with the Ministry of Defense? Thank you. Yeah. I don't know how many Malay officers they have who are female in the Navy. You know, these are not matters that you know, come up to me, so I have to <laughs> say, Please ask the Ministry of Defense. <laughs> I mean, how do I know how many male and female officers of different ethnicities there are in each of the services? Yeah. Right, so he doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can we have one question over there? Hi, uh, I'm Fatan. I'm from the Institute of Policy Studies. Um, um, uh, earlier I asked about the future of pluralism. Um, um, when Minister Shamukam talked about um, the Malay community's needs, I was actually admittedly a little bit uncomfortable. Um, I wanted to ask what efforts... Not, not so much needs, <laughs> but uh, a sense of uh, place in Singapore and uh, a, conf a sort of, not guarantee, but uh, government commitment to try and make sure that the Malay percentage in the population remains constant. Yeah. Um, um, I'd like to ask, how can we avoid essentializing certain groups in the interest of being sensitive? Are we ready to embrace a more nuanced approach to race and maybe other forms of pluralism as well? Um, and i also like to take the time to thank uh, Karina for the sharing earlier, it was very meaningful. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. I mean, is, what do you mean by essentializing? Um, is it that we, sh I mean, we sh I think we need to be sensitive about what each uh, racial group wants or says, but uh, 
in, if you specifically refer to the context of the percentages, I think actually we see it as positive when we say, when the government comes out and says, we will keep the percentages constant, we see it as kind of giving an assurance so that people feel assured of their place and they're not going to be overtaken. And, you know, life in Singapore would be broadly similar. But as others have pointed out, Meanwhile, the intermarriages, the changes, you know, all that is happening on the ground. So, you know, these things will carry on. So I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Would you like to quickly clarify? Does that answer your question? Um, I think I'm thinking more about... Uh, how, how can we... How can we avoid talking about race? <laughs> no, um, more like avoid talking about like you mentioned, there's interracial marriages and all that. And, so, and the definition of what it means to be a certain group is changing. And um, yeah, how can we avoid? I, are there efforts in place to avoid essentializing groups and, and um, solidifying a certain definition of these groups? Of yeah. what it looks like to be a Chinese or Malay or Indian or... I, I don't think government is in the business of uh, Define. defining this. I mean, the parents choose the identity and, you know, your identity is usually self-evident, uh, usually, but not always. And uh, these are matters of individual choices. The government can only have broad policy frameworks based on, you know, sort of a majority, uh, what works in specific situations in a majority of the times, like ethnic integration policy. But otherwise, you need to just be careful that society is changing and evolving, and you don't, I think you don't make, we don't make race central to many of these things. But where data is necessary, when I talk to the Indian community, I tell them, okay, these are your percentages, this is how it is, so this is how it's working in the education sphere, you need to do this. And as the writer said just now, she thinks that, and, and a lot of people think like her, it's useful to have these percentages because we need to know how well a community is doing and what more can be done to push them up. So th you, you use data to help people. Um, I think we'll just... And Can I just clarify? Yeah. So I think it's useful to have data to know how each community is progressing as to whether the percentages should be fixed, 14, 8, whatever. I think that is going to be an ongoing debate that will be determined by everyone going forward. Yes. But I think maybe your point on essentialism is to say that the, community, the different communities are not homogenous, that you know, they, they do not represent one monolithic view. And I think we do need to acknowledge that within the Malay community, the diversity of positions when it comes to certain fundamental issues of religion and LGBT and all that, those differences are real and they will have to be managed through conversations within the community itself, I think. Thank you. Now, I do want to ask this last question because I was waiting for it to come out, but it hasn't. Um, because Zoraida raised a very important point on political pluralism and that the PAP government, the ruling party, really would like to remain the voice and to have its views heard mainly. Uh, I would like to hear what minister has to say in response to the inability of the PAP to accept diverse views. <laughs> <laughs> inability of the PAP to accept diverse views. Uh, I, you know, whenever I hear these remarks, uh, as I was listening to Zoraida, I was thinking, you know, in the end, everything becomes the PAP's fault <laughs> and the PAP's <laughs> problems. For example, here, let's look at uh, political pluralism. It is not the PAP which decides the current structure of parliament. It's the people who decide. The people vote. And uh, if the people choose a certain structure, that's what parliament reflects. That's not the PAP's fault. 
And um, I have no doubt that if the PAP doesn't perform, it can be out in a single election because all constituencies in Singapore are more or less the same. It's a highly educated um, population. People know what they want, and, uh, they are, and it's, the thresholds and the barriers for entry into politics are very low in Singapore. You don't need a lot of money. You can cover constituencies in five days. And, uh, you know, it's very easy for the government to lose power in a single election. So to say that uh, we don't welcome uh, diversity, I think it's not accurate. I think what you really mean is we don't like uh, or we don't want to lose power to somebody else. I'm not sure you will find any ruling party or any party in the world that wants to lose their elections. When you compete, you compete to win. Specifically on political pluralism, uh, I think for a Western-trained mind like myself, for Zoraida, uh, political science and so on, it's a very attractive idea because pluralism must be good, right? Diversity of viewpoints, different arguments, you get... When I, as a practitioner of politics, sitting around and looking at around the world, so in theory, I found it very attractive when I came into politics. In practice, when I look around, both in Singapore and uh, elsewhere in the world, I am yet to come across, outside of Scandinavia, any country that has successfully made political pluralism work for its citizens. Particularly when you factor in the fact that we are extremely small and have a variety of uh, natural insecurities. Okay? And leave aside whether it's me or somebody else or you know, PAP or whatever. This is Singapore, this is what you have, this is our geography, this is where we are. Does it work for us? I don't know. Okay? I mean, eventually I'm sure we will find out at some point. But having said that, let me also make this point. I've gone around studying political systems, even though I'm not a political science student, and I haven't found any single party dictatorship that has worked either or a single party government. I mean, you look at the post-colonial societies, uh, post-Second World War, post-colonial societies. Every model has been tried. Single party, single party dictatorship, military dictatorship, multi-party, uniformly all have failed. The only exceptions to that have been a number of countries in East Asia. South Korea under military dictatorship, Malaysia for a while, Taiwan, not a country for a while, China now, um, and Singapore. But uniquely amongst them, Singapore is the only country that has had elections uh, throughout without ever suspending elections. Even India suspended. And uh, so if you were to look at the practice of politics, you will come away deeply pessimistic about the ability of any political system to deliver good governance. Because in the end, whether it's multi-party democracy, whether it is two-party democracy, whether it's a single party, all of them, in the end, revert down and don't reach their potential of what they could be, even Japan. Right? I mean, it's a classic example. It's a democracy, it's a great society, but what, I mean, for a number of years, I think it lost, perhaps didn't achieve its full potential, you can say, even though it's great to be a Japanese. So if you look, come back to Singapore, I showed you those bubbles just now, our size versus GDP and our population versus GDP. Uh, would some other system have uh, allowed us to have achieved that? I don't know is the answer. I mean, I can't give you a clear answer. But I think it has in the past worked for us. But what's worked in the past may not work in the future. Uh, but at the same time, copying somebody else's model, I think uh, the, as a logical point, I will say this, when your political systems resemble that of others, then you must be prepared for the results to resemble that of others too.
You can't expect uh, your political system to look like, say, the American system or the UK system, but then want a different outcome. Maybe we are unique, Singapore is special and we'll be able to do it. And hey, you know, Lee Kuan Yew, Go Chok Tong, Lee Sien Lung, Lawrence Wong, but uh, projecting it into many years into the future, what guarantee that whoever is in charge is going to deliver the same sort of governance? Which is why I said, I have seen all the systems, I've studied them. Ultimately, it is our society's ability to choose good leaders in whichever system that they want. And it's not the PAP that decides whether there's greater or less pluralism. It's the people of Singapore who decide. And likewise, you know, the point about Tharman, as I was listening, I was thinking to myself, if it had been some other candidate, people would have said, you look at the PAP, you know, they won't put up a strong candidate, or they don't put up Tharman. If Mr. Tharman, and does anybody think that he is anyone's patsy, or you know, someone asks him to stand and he stands, he is his own man, he decides, he makes up his mind. And uh, if you look at it like that, he's a strong candidate, does that become the PAP's fault <laughs> that he's a strong candidate? <laughs> if the Prime Minister had stood in the next presidential elections, are we supposed to all take a bow and say, I'm very sorry that the Prime Minister is standing. We are putting up such a strong candidate. <laughs> I think some things are probably <clears throat> properly laid at our door and some things I think we shouldn't be responsible for. <laughs> a good candidate comes forward well, that's pluralism, and you know, Singapore has other good candidates. They should come forward, too. Uh, one more minute. Okay. Um, Half a minute. Okay, very quick response. <laughs> Great. I don't disagree fundamentally. But I think it's not about a binary or false choices. I think it's about whether or not we are happy with the system as it exists today, or we believe it can do better whether we are happy with a concentration of power or more accountable power. Uh, thank I would you. say we are accountable. We are highly accountable in Singapore. But uh, yes, there is a concentration of power because the overwhelming supermajority in the ruling party. But I never believe that we are not accountable. We are accountable for everything we do. And the opposition, small as it is, Make sure in any way the population will make us accountable. Yeah. Thank you. Now we've had an excellent session, I think you will agree. So let's thank the speakers in that right way. <laughs>